Hello, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon. Um, my name is Elizabeth Ottinger, and I will be moderating the last four talks before the panel. Um, I am a um, project manager within the therapeutics development branch um, at NCATS, and I luckily have been collaboratively working with several of the speakers in the next sessions on gene therapy for the organic acidemias. So our first talk is by Dr. Um, Oleg Tshelikov, and he will be he is a clinical geneticist and a physician scientist at NHGRI, and he's going to be speaking to us about machine learning for biomarker data mining in organic acidemias. Hello, my name is Oleg. I'm clinical geneticist and physician scientist in the National Human Genome Research Institute in Dr. Vindita's lab. Today, I would like to share with you one aspect of research conducted in the Vindita lab focusing on the natural history of organic acidemias and specifically how we use data collected through natural history of propionic acidemia to help us search for resilient biomarkers that can be used in a wide range of clinical contexts. My main focus today will be pharmacodynamic biomarkers, often referred to as response biomarkers, potentially suitable for future clinical trials. The natural history work would not be possible without a large and productive group headed by Dr. Nunditi. And uh, without any uh, the hard work of many of our colleagues at the NIH Clinical Center. We thank our patients who participated in the natural history study, who are the ultimate goal and the source of inspiration for our work. I'm confident that today I'm speaking to a highly educated audience, and this pathway is very familiar to you. In showing you this slide, I would like to highlight several facts. First, breakdown of propionyl coenzyme A carboxylase results in propionic acidemia that biochemically can be characterized by elevated 2-methyl citrate and propionyl carnitine, also known as C3. Second, our previous work has demonstrated that the rate of conversion of oral propionate into CO2 appearing in breath may correlate with the severity of pathogenic variants in PCCA and PCCB two genes associated with propionic acidemia. And third, serum FGF21 and GDF15 can be elevated in a wide range of metabolic conditions that affect normal bi mitochondrial biology, but their role in PA is incompletely understood. The normal functioning of this pathway is critical to our well-being, as demonstrated by the fact that propionyl coenzyme A car carboxylase deficiency can result in a severe multisystemic disease, as well as metabolic instability. Data from our natural history study had demonstrated that the frequency, prevalence, and severity of these complications are not universally distributed among patients. For example, PA patients homozygous for the so-called Mennonite Amish variant in PCCB uh, may experience a low frequency of episodes of metabolic decompensation, but could be at high risk to develop dilated cardiomyopathy. The mechanisms underlying different clinical trajectories and for the purpose of this work, biomarkers predictive of clinical outcomes are incompletely understood. The natural history study of propionic acidemia at NIH began in late 2017. It has produced a relatively large genomic, genomically heterogeneous cohort of participants. As our participants began to return to NIH for their second and third visits, this largely cross-sectional data set is being transformed into a longitudinal data set. As of this week, we have enrolled 44 participants and keep track of close to 500 clinical imaging, laboratory, and dietary parameters. Like our colleagues, uh, we had noticed heterogeneity of clinical outcomes in the NIHPA cohort. We sought to explore this feature to answer a relatively straightforward question. Can we find in our data set biomarkers that are associated with better clinical outcomes? We can also look at the same question from a slightly different angle and ask a related question. If these biomarkers track with clinical outcomes, would they improve in PA patients after liver transplantation? An ideal response biomarker has to satisfy a long list of requirements. Here, I outline some of them. In PA biomarker, uh, APA biomarker needs to track with important clinical outcomes, such as survival functioning or quality of life. It needs to be resilient under a wide range of physiological conditions. For example, Early observations in our study suggested that classic diagnostic biomarkers of PA can range widely depending on the status of renal function. A response biomarker can improve after meaningful therapeutic intervention, 
In this study, we made an assumption that liver transplantation can serve as a prototypic intervention aimed to restore hepatic functioning of propionylquinzone A carboxylase, thus foreshadowing future interventions aiming to restore enzyme activity in the liver, for example, AAV-mediated gene therapy. The results should be intelligible to clinical investigators. In other words, a biomarker should be readily uh, interpretable by physicians. And finally, a biomarker should be available to physicians as it leaves the confines of clinical investigative environment and finds its way into the clinic. As I alluded in my previous slide, we first turned our attention to two classic biomarkers of propionic acidemia, plasma total 2-methyl citrate and plasma propionic carnitine, which perform admirably in the diagnostic context of newborn screening. As you can see from these two graphs, both biomarkers struggle to differentiate between two clinical states before and after liver transplant. Our additional study suggested several possible reasons for this somewhat surprising result. First, PA patients can develop or have their uh, chronic kidney disease uncovered by liver transplantation. Their pr protein intake and the dose of liver carnitine can change after receiving liver transplant. But there was at least one more possibility to explain a relatively poor performance of 2-methyl citrate and propionyl carnitine. We hypothesized that there could be an inherent bias in the cohort due to only severe patients being referred to transplantation. It is possible, at least in principle, that in, several patient, uh, in severe patients, there are limits as to how low these biomarkers can go, thus creating a floor effect. Using k-means clustering approach, we constructed a subset of variables composed of 12 clinical parameters that we believe define the clinical course of propionic acidemia. These include full-scale IQ, optic nerve abnormality, sensory neural hearing loss, height, alanine aminotransferase, CBC parameters, left ventricular ejection fraction, cystatin C-based glomerular filtration rate, total and incomplete protein intake. We used Hopkins statistics to measure cluster tendency. Interestingly, when we ran a clustering analysis using only two biochemical parameters, 2-methyl citrate and propionyl carnitine, the model could separate, clearly separate PA cohort into two, even three clusters. These results supported our clinical intuition that there indeed could be several subtypes of propionic acidemia and motivated us to look for a laboratory parameter that could help us define these subtypes better. If we were to find a way to leverage clinical heterogeneity of our PA cohort, we needed to address potential crippling limitations of its small data set size and possibly even moderate our research agenda. I outlined some of the most uh, critical limitations here. Outliers in small data set are known to have an outsized effect on the statistical model. We attempted to control this limitation using normalization procedure. We are aware of a particular pattern of missingness of data in serious disease uh, data sets that is missingness at random. For example, severe patients uh, tend to be affected by intellectual disability and autism, and they can have difficulties complying with, so complying with some tests, which can thus create a systematic bias. We attempted to con uh, control for the missingness of data using the k-nearest neighbor approach. And finally, perhaps one of the more challenging issues with small data sets in rare disease is the mix of categorical continuous variables, non-linear relationships, and the peculiar issue of P being much greater, greater than N, that is the number of disease parameters far exceeding the number of participants. This issue is especially common in genomic data sets. To address the latter set of issues, we sought to exploit the flexibility and power of supervised machine learning to statistically model propionic acidemia. To help explain the nature of supervised machine learning, I would like to use the following illustration. Imagine an equalizer with its many knobs and slides like any illustration, an allusion to equalizer has its limitations. Still, I hope it can offer some useful insights into what's happening under the hood. First, there are presets, different types of approaches to, to, to statistical modeling, such as support vector machines, random forest, Adabus, and so on. These approaches to modeling sometimes differ from each other in fundamental ways related to their mathematics, offering their advantages and disadvantages in different contexts. Second, there are hyperparameters. For this model, some of the most hyperparameters include the number of cross-validation, degree, scale, and so on. Third, there are clinical and lab laboratory parameters which the machine learning can optimize to build an idealized statistical model of propionic acidemia. Finally, as the name suggests, 
Training of the supervised machine learning requires not only input disease variables, but also, quote, correct, unquote, answers. To obtain these correct answers, we approached three judges, three specialists with deep and intricate understanding of the natural history of organic acidemias. We provided them with standardized description of each patient in the cohort, but withheld from them data describing novel biomarkers. Inspired by our earlier cluster nest experiments, we asked uh, them to classify each patient as either mild or severe class of PA. These data then were fed into the statistical modeling application using R. In the series of informatics experiments, in addition to the 12 clinical parameters that I outlined earlier, we created an opportunity for the machine to get access to any other variable in the data set to help it improve the predictive accuracy of classification generated by clinical judges. Their most successful models then were collated and ranked according to their average prediction accuracy. In this graph, I compare four models out of many models that were generated using this approach. On the left, you see the results of a model composed of only 12 or fewer clinical parameters. Each dot in this graph represents an average predictive accuracy of 1,000 models. The number of model, this number of models was generated through repartitioning into training and testing subsets. It was a necessary step to deal with two issues inherent to small data sets. First, because partitioning to training and testing subsets was, do uh, was done randomly, some training and testing subsets lacked variance to enable support vector machine modeling or the learning step. Second, in small data sets, the order in which uh, patients join the study can make a big difference in the predictive ability of a model. The last model of the, on the right, composed of the 12 clinical parameters plus propionate oxidation, showed improved average accuracy prediction, which was used as an unbiased method to rank models, uh, identify relevant features of the propionic acidemia model, and select biomarkers for the validation step um, uh, in the next for the next validation step. Using our illustration of an equalizer, I hope you can appreciate how support vector machine uses slides to adjust the role of each variables to optimize its predictive accuracy. Depicted here is the model composed of 12 clinical parameters plus propionate oxidation. In it, the propionate oxidation appears to be the most important variable that helps optimize its accuracy, while the dietary parameters and left ventricular ejection fraction were depreciated. The ranking order of each model in its 13th parameter which were used to, to help us understand how each biomarker performs in, the, in comparison to known clinical or diagnostic uh, parameters. As you can appreciate from these graphs, in vivo whole body propionate oxidation correlated well with 2-methyl citrate, propionyl carnitine, full-scale IQ, and uh, linear out, uh, growth outcomes. Moreover, Propionate oxidation demonstrated its resilience over a wide range of estimated glomerular filtration rates using cystatin C. In addition to identifying propionate oxidation as a potential response biomarker suitable for clinical trials aimed to restore propionate oxidation in the liver, we identified additional candidate response biomarkers, some of which are shown here, plasma GDF15, plasma GDF21, alanine to serine ratio, and plasma uh, transthyretin, also known as plasma pre prealbumin. We share, shared the methodology and results of our approach in a recent publication. In summary, we provide evidence that 2-methyl citrate and propionyl carnitine may underperform as response biomarkers under some clinical scenarios. More than one cluster of severity may exist in propionic acidemia. We shared our experience of harnessing experts' knowledge combined with statistical modeling to uh, screen for potential novel response biomarkers. And we hope that our approach will inspire other investigators to adopt machine learning approaches to mine their rare disease data sets and enable future clinical trials. Thank you for, for your time and attention. Hi, Oleg. How are you? Good afternoon. Hi. Thank you for your talk. Um, there was one question here um, where someone was asking, when you were showing the data on the um, biomarker, the changes in the biomarker um, before and after um, with liver transplantation or without, um, how were those cohorts? Were they um, pre-transplantation patients as your control and then after transplantation or were they separate cohorts? Yeah, admittedly, um, our transplant uh, subgroup is fairly small. 
we had uh, we enrolled five uh, participants, um, and we did not have for the vast majority of uh, parameters that we keep track of. We did not have we did not have their pre-transplant uh, parameters. Specifically, if the question is about two methyl citrate and uh, uh, propionyl carnitine, we did not have um, a complete set of of, of uh, parameters to enable statistical study. Um, I had a question. Um, I don't see any right now. Um, so I was wondering, you know, earlier today um, we heard a talk from Dr. Forney where he was actually looking at omics approaches. And so I was wondering if you have thought about anything in that um, realm to relate the data now that you've done with machine learning, um, where you've segregated according to phenotype um, to actually then try to correlate with some of the omics data, whether it's genomic, you know, metabolomic and um, others. Yeah. yeah, undoubtedly, uh, machine learning can be used on, uh, you know, data sets uh, to identify patterns uh, that are, you know, could be difficult to discern, um, you know, to a, a human eye, unless a, a person who works with that data set, you know, is a sort of specialist who spends a lot of time thinking about this. So, um, you know, so there are, uh, you know, these are the advantages of uh, machine learning, uh, for sure. I think the biggest problem for the vast majority of uh, machine learning approaches that we have now in place is the size of the data sets. For example, you know, the, a typical application for, you know, machine learning uh, or in order to train a model, you would need to have like 10,000, 20,000, uh, you know, entries or rows, uh, participants. Uh, unfortunately for the vast majority of uh, rare diseases, there's no way we could, uh, you know, get to that point uh, um, in time where we have enough uh, uh, points to enable large-scale machine learning experiments. So, um, there are we in in our paper in our work we attempted to, um, you know, use different uh, techniques to maximize and take to leverage every every piece of information that's available in the data set to first address the missingness of data, and the second thing by you know maximizing the uh, uh, you know statistical modeling itself to uh, uh, to generate a, a relatively stable model of propionic acidemia. Now I think you know uh, one of the biggest worries that I have about machine learning uh, is on very small data sets, and certainly forty participants is not a very big data set by any means. Is how the uh, conclusions are would be used. For example, um, you know we made very um, you know. We made a lot of effort to avoid stating that we have, uh, you know, a comprehensive model of propionic acidemia. I just don't think it's possible. But when you ask yourself a slightly different question, what are the relevant features that we can we can we can extract from a small data set in order to predict judges' scores or judges' assignment? I think that's a slightly different uh, question, and the answer is I think it is possible, at least in the based on our current experience as long as we're able to you know, do go through a, some kind of validation step. So we did have to make an assumption uh, in our experiments um, uh, you know, that uh, patients who receive liver transplant, at least in, in principle, for some biochemical and clinical parameters transition from the severe form to milder form. And so that's what we try to take, take advantage of that paradigm to uh, validate some of these biomarkers. So apologize, this is probably a long answer to, uh, to a very simple question, but uh, this is a loaded question for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you addressed a little bit because there is a question here, you know, when you do machine learning on the small data sets, mm -hmm. there's always the chance of overfitting. And so I don't know if there was anything else you wanted to explain. I, I'm, I'm not sure. Well, the overfit with, uh, you know, kernel, uh, well, polynomial kernel uh, support vector machines, there's always a concern about overfitting. Uh, so, but, you know, it depends on how you use the hyperparameters. I don't think the, the you know, for the kernel, the, the issue for the kernel uh, support vector machine is overfitting. It's, it's usually on instability of a model. So if you were to add more patients, you know, the, the entire model could just change so much that it no, loses its predictive ability. That's, I think, is the main concern. Depending on how you choose your high param parameters, you could avoid, in principle, you know, uh, you know, like using, just stay with a linear kernel uh, support vector machine, which can help with, you know, control uh, for, um, you know, for overfitting, at least in principle, um, yeah. 
So I guess maybe one more question. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, part of this is that you're trying to understand bar biomarkers for the actual clinical, when you do a clinical trial and you're trying to understand what you could use as a possible surrogate for interventions and then having these heterogeneous populations, how would that correlate, right? Um, I think there was a question like, could the propanil carnitine be used for disease monitoring um, or is it just for prognosis or could that actually... You know, what are you thinking in terms so of... So the answer is yes case. and no, and I think it really depends on the context. You know, some of it is disease monitoring, that's one context. Diagnostic uh, uh, performance of these biomarkers, that's like newborn screen. That's a slightly different uh, biomark uh, context. You know, response biomarker for clinical trials, so surrogate endpoint, and, you know, for phase three cl uh, clinical trials. So th these are all different contexts, and I think that's why it's hard to give one simple answer. Um, could, could under some circumstances, these, like for example, C3, can it be used to, to monitor at least something? The answer is yes. You know, can you control uh, the disease or like adjust the diet? In my opinion, no. Uh, you know, is it predictive of the severity of the disease? I think to some extent, yes. Again, there are some limitations as to how much we can say, um, you know, how well this uh, parameter performs out there in the wild. And the biggest problem with C3 or two methyl citrate is uh, they go they range widely depending on the renal status. And as you can see, you know, a patient may have a mild disease, you know, if you were to characterize it using uh, enzymatic activity. But you know, if you were to you know see that in a patient who is 50 years of age and develop chronic kidney disease, some of these parameters will be very high. So, you know, and that's what machine learning approaches are so good at is to package everything together and, and develop a model that is able to take all of those things into account, you know, disregarding nonlinear relationships and mix, you know, categorical and uh, continuous variables together you know, all in one package. Great. I think we'll, we'll end there. Thank you. Talk, um, so that you can talk more in the panel and people have more questions. Thank you, Oli. Thank you. Okay, for our next talk, um, we're going to have um, Dr. Randy, Ch uh, Dr. Oh, sorry, Dr. Kimberly Chapman, sorry, I'm confused, um, who's the associate, um, she's an associate professor of pediatrics at George Washington School of Medicine and Health Sciences, and she's going to be talking to us um, about um, a hepatocyte based models and how they're used for small molecule therapies for MMA and PA. Hi, um, I have the pleasure of talking about uh, a model system in which we were able to develop a small molecule therapy for MMA and PA. So my disclosures is I'm a member of the Hemisphere Therapeutics Clinical Advisory Board for the HSC 5040 phase two HERO clinical trial, which is the medication that is currently in clinical trial that we'll talk about. In addition, Children's National has an ongoing research relationship with Hemisphere Therapeutics in MMA and PA. So a search for therapy. So today we've talked a lot about PA and MMA, and these can have devastating impact on our patients. And there's a high unmet need in this patient population in that individuals don't do as well as we would like them to. So currently therapy focuses on reducing substrates, scavenging toxins with level carnitine and nitrogen scavengers, replacing what's not made with biocitra, and trying to make the enzyme work better using the cofactors cobolamine or biotin depending on the underlying disorder. And finally, we use liver or liver kidney transplants in hopes of making individuals more stable. But as you know, despite all of our therapies, including transplant, individuals continue to have complications. And they continue to have elevated propanol CoA drive toxin metabolites in other organs, such as their kidneys, their brains, their muscles, even if they have a liver transplant. And there's reports of renal complications following renal uh, following kidney transplant. And some of this is certainly co um, complicated by the NA rejection medications that we use. And there's also reports of metabolic strokes fo following transplant. And this can be devastating, especially in a group of individuals who felt that they were under much better metabolic control. There's reports of vision and hearing loss as well. So as you know, our therapies, decreasing intermediates, 
trying to decrease and scavenge toxins, replacing what we cannot replace is not adequate, nor is transplant a cure. And in this light, we thought that potentially a small molecule therapy would be of benefit to our patient population. The challenge was, how do you identify a small molecule that would be a benefit to this population? And how do you determine model systems that would be appropriate? So several years ago, we started to work with a company called Hemashir. And the reason we started to work with them is their technology. So they have a reveal technology, which recapitulates the biology of patient cells. As you know, the liver is fairly complicated. There are multiple portions of it. And in fact, there's flow. There's hemodynamic flow and transmural flow that requires that is required by the liver cells to maintain their normal phenotypes. And here is a picture of a, of a stain looking at an in vivo liver. And if you'll notice, these uh, create different patterns and uh, sinusoids. Now, in most cases, if we just take these hepatocytes out of a liver, they actually become fibroblasts and they change in vitro in a Petri dish. However, in our collaboration with Hemisher, we were able to identify a model system in which we were able for our patients' cells to recapitulate normal biology. And this actually offered us, a, offered us an opportunity to start screenings for small molecules. Now, utilizing patients with PA and MMA, we identified a number of markers of these disorders and then looked to see whether these markers were created within this model system. And this is a pathway that you're all familiar with, we've reviewed, and I'm not gonna focus too heavily on it, except to point out that each of these, these letters correlate with one of the things that we looked at in our patient population. So here we looked at pro propanyl-CoA levels and we looked at normal uh, cells in green, cells derived from an explanted liver from a patient who was already going undergoing a liver transplant for therapy and cells from a liver explanted from an individual with MMA. And if you'll note that both the PA and the MMA um, propanol CoA levels were extremely high. And this is a logarithmic. So this is approximately 10 times higher than the normal cells. This recapitulates what we see in patients. Similarly, if we looked at methylmalonyl CoA in our MMA cells compared to normal cells, they also have us, these cells have a significantly high MMA levels. And then we started to look at some markers of the disease such that we looked at the ratio of C3 to C2. And again, our PA and MMA cell lines were much higher than those from the control group. And then we also looked at 2-methyl citrate, one of the diagnostic criteria. This was not detected in cells from individuals who do not have PA and MMA, but was readily uh, detected in those with MMA and PA. And finally, we looked at a stable isotope, 13C MMA, to determine whether or not you also saw an elevation. And in fact, you did see an elevation in these cell lines. So then we said, okay, currently therapy looks util utilizes bicitra to recapitulate the to recapitulate the uh, the deficiency in CoA. And again, this is our propanol pathway coming in looking at the portions of the TCA cycle. And in this case, we treated uh, cells from PA patients in the model system using bicitra and looked at whether or not we saw an increase in those treated with disodium citrate versus a DMSO control. And as you can see, we in fact do see an increase in all of the pathway beyond where citrate enters. And this decreases a little bit as we go around the cycle. Now this is recapitulates what has been seen in humans and consequently provided additional evidence that this model system could be utilized to screen for, to screen for new medications. So what did we do? So we took a number of small molecules and this is just an example of different molecules 
they're numbered um, just according to the, the number that we utilized and looked at whether or not these small molecules decrease propanyl-CoA production in our model system using cell lines from individuals who had PA or MMA. And in most cases, these individuals had PA. And identify, and going through this pathway, we identified some cells that did not decrease as much as we would like and some cell lines that decreased to significant amount. And consequently, we selected a compound 10, which then further was named H HST5040 and looked at the, the dose criteria from 0 0.01 micromole all the way up to 100 micromoles and looked and determined that the propanyl-CoA path or propanyl-CoA levels dropped in these lines in the presence of this particular in this particular small molecule with an EC50 of 0.94 micromoles. This allowed us to say that this was a potential therapeutic and was a small molecule. We went on to look at a number of other cell lines. So again, this is the pathway to which you are particularly familiar. And each of these blue letters correlate with a dose response curve in the presence of HST5040, looking at doses from 0 0.01 micromolar all the way out to 100 micromolar in these particular cell lines to recapitulate a decompensation effect, we used a higher level of branch chain amino acids than would ordinarily be in the media, however, would be seen in individuals who are decompensated. Looking at individuals with a PA and MMA as a cohort and looking at the dose response curve, we saw a nice decrease in the level of propanyl-CoA we also saw a nice decrease in the level of methylmalonyl-CoA in the MMA lines. In the MMA and PA lines, we also saw a decrease in the C3 to C2 ratio. And in the MMA lines alone, we saw a decrease in methylmalonic acid. In addition, we saw a decrease in the 2-methyl citric acid um, over the multiple doses. At this point, we thought that this would be a, a particularly interesting molecule to continue to follow in individuals. And as I said, we then asked the question about what happens if these individuals are in metabolic crisis. And so this is an individual with PA for whom their hepatocytes were donated and we placed them into the device. In the low propanyl um, media, we saw, uh, saw a little bit of a decrease in propanyl-CoA. Um, and uh, we would not see a decrease in methylmalonyl-CoA, even in the stable isotope. And in the higher uh, propriogenic media, as illustrated over here, we saw a significant decrease. We then looked at an MMA donor and demonstrated a similar response, uh, but a little bit more muted than the previous. And finally, we asked the question about, about methylmalonic acid. And in fact, we saw a similar response in our MMA donor. So then to determine whether or not uh, we were able to derive, uh, decrease the amount of propanyl-CoA and uh, to the uh, the propanyl-CoA and methylmalonyl-CoA in our PA uh, hepatocytes and MMA hepatocytes using different sources. We, we utilize the strength of stable isotope using a uh, stable isotope la labeled isoleucine, three ketovaline, three methyl or 13 isotope uh, methionine, 13 carbon isotope threonine and 13 carbon hepatinoate at the following concentrations and identified that HST5040 were in fact able to drop all of these uh, precursors propanyl-CoA um, response as was expected. Then looking at MMA uh, hepatocytes, we noticed a similar response across all of these different sources 
for propanyl-CoA in both propanyl-CoA and methylmalonyl-CoA. I like to highlight that mo these responses all are occurring about the same dose of HST5040, which allowed us to determine what dose we would like to start the clinical trials with. Having followed all of these things, we've noticed that these reduce propanyl-CoA and methylmalonyl-CoA metabolites from all the different sources uh, that lead to propanyl-CoA, methylmalonyl-CoA in individuals with PA and MMA. It reduces the derived metabolites, including 2-methyl citrate as well as methylmalonic acid, which have been thought to cause the abnormality or the metabolic decompensation. And it reduces a number of the compounds that are thought to inhibit the TCA cycle enzymes, as well as the urea cycle intermediates. And consequently, we have taken this to, um, taken this to a phase two clinical trial, and it reaches all tissues, including CNS, as evidenced by our mini pig study. It's anticipated to be able to be dosed only once daily by oral gastric tube. It is a liquid. Um, it was cleared IND for a phase two tri trial, and it's been granted a U.S. orphan drug rare a pediatric disease in fast track. Currently, the clinical trial uh, is open for 12 patients with MMA and PA over the age of two. There are 10 sites throughout the United States since the three-phase design. At this point, I'd like to thank um, all the folks that participated in this, including our patients and caregivers, as well as my collaborators at Children's National, our collaborators at Hemisphere, and then all the places that were able to donate us hepatocytes. Uh, predominantly, these come from Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh and uh, Georgetown, as well as NIH, for some of the initial funding. Thank you. At this point, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Hi, good afternoon, Dr. Chapman. Thank you for your talk. Um, it's always exciting when we see uh, molecules move to the clinic for testing as therapeutics for patients. Um, I have one general question. Um, you did this uh, screening and then um, you told us, you know, you got into the clinic. I was wondering if you could outline a little bit so that people understand um, what the process is like in between there. Did you do animal studies? What other studies so, um, so, are required? So HST5040 has actually been studied previously in humans. Um, it was used uh, originally as a clinical trial for individuals with thalassemias and sickle cell-like diseases. And so consequently, several of the preliminary things that we would ordinarily do, and it was just uh, serendipity that we actually identified a drug that had previously been studied. It wasn't actually part of the plan. Um, it was an observation as we were doing a series of screening molecules. Um, we did do mini pigs because the plan is to go to individuals less than two. Um, and then we did try to study it in a mouse model. The problem is mice actually metabolize this drug very quickly. And consequently, if you did a mouse model screen, um, you may not identify it as being, um, as being active within the system. Okay, and there's a couple questions on mechanism. Um, I don't know if you want to address, I'm kind of wondering how it works and um, you know, what it does. Action so, of the drug. so it appears to be a CoA scavenger within the mitochondria um, and then gets it um, eliminated as a CoA compound, so an HST CoA. Um, it does not appear to impact acetyl CoA levels within the mitochondrial significantly, although there is some minor impact on those. Um, we're still working our way through some of the pathophysiology that, as it would be related to PA and MMA, um, and there's a number of ongoing studies in which we're studying it. Um, just a general question, since it is a repurposing, in a way, molecule that there was some previous clinical experience, um, what is the path, um, again, to any type of, um, like, approval or access? Is it because of the orphan drug designation? Is Because, again, there probably is no IP, really, that can be generated, just so 
again, to understand what would be the long-term plan of, of access for patients. So the idea is to go through a phase two and phase clinical trial, um, given that the phase one has been basically completed. We are filling in the parts that have to do with metabolism for a PA or MMA patient, because that may differ from individuals with typical biochemistry. Um, and uh, then I would say the path is fairly similar. We were given access um, to being able to use HST 5040 from the original and um, mm -hmm. did in fact put in an idea as, as you would typically. Okay. Um, so all very exciting. I guess if, um, the last question was, do you have any data regarding clinical benefits or major side effects? Um, again, um, I don't know if the phase one was in patients or was there any preliminary um, assessment that you so, could provide? So it, the side effects are related to much higher doses than what we see, and they're almost all GI. Um, we're planning on dosing at approximately um, about five to 10 times less than what they were utilizing. The original aim of the original um, phase one and actually phase two study with the drug was to look for um, increase in fetal hemoglobin. It didn't seem to impact fetal hemoglobin increase in those folks. And most folks, as I said, only saw, we only saw symptoms of uh, mostly gastric upset at higher doses. Okay, great. Um, well, I think we will end there and um, there'll be more questions hopefully in the panel session at the end. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, our next talk is by Dr. Randy Chandler um, and he is a staff scientist at NHGRI in the lab of Dr. Um, Chuck Venditti. And he's been working for probably more than 20 years on mouse models, um, in the organic acidemias and also um, on gene therapy. So I will let uh, Randy give his talk. Thank you. Hi, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me today to present our lab's work on systemic AV gene therapy with propionic acidemia. This is my disclosure slide. Uh, here's an overview of propionyl CoA metabolism. Uh, propionyl CoA is converted to succinyl CoA. A crucial enzymatic step in this, in this pathway is performed by the propionyl carboxylase enzyme. Defects in either or the PCCA or PCC gene can cause propionic acidemia, which results in the elevation of biomarkers such as methyl citrate. This is a, a, a complex enzyme which is composed of two out, or sorry, six alpha and six beta subunits. Uh, propionic acidemia is a multi-systemic multi disorder. Uh, it can be lethal, and elective liver transplantation has been shown to be beneficial in patients. Uh, but later in life, uh, the disease can result in, in severe complications, such as cardiomyopathy. There's been quite a bit of published research on gene therapy for propionic acidemia. This includes the rescue of neonatal lethal models, the treatment of hypomorphic uh, models of propionic acidemia with a variety of different uh, serotypes and different uh, tissue specific uh, uh, targeting, as well as um, RNA gene therapy to treat propionic acidemia. But in today's talk, I will specifically uh, cover the work that's been done in our lab. Uh, the first murine model of propionic acid, ac acidemia was created by knocking out the first four exons of the PCCA gene. This resulted in a neonatal lethal mice with elevations in metabolites. Uh, what this early paper was able to show is by using a transgenic cassette that expressed the PCCA gene in only the liver, it was able to they were able to rescue these, these mice from neonatal lethality. Uh, restore the enzymatic activity and decrease the levels of uh, biomarkers or, or disease-related biomarkers in these mice. Uh, we used these same mice to test our first AEV vector. It was an AEV8 using the ubiquitous chicken beta actin promoter to express a, a human PCCA uh, gene at a dose of 10 
20, 10 to the uh, to the tenth per pup. Uh, we showed that these we were able to rescue the neonatal lethal phenotype for as long as 125 days. We were able to have achieve significant protein expression in the livers of these mice, and we were able to, to reduce uh, significantly reduce but not normalize the disease related uh, metabolite methyl citrate. Uh, because, because the early mice were um, a little bit different than the patients in that they had a large uh, deletion, we, we uh, tried try to develop new mice using a uh, CAS CRISPR mediated gene editing and, and uh, non homologous end joining and also a, a targeted approach to knock in a, a, a hypomorphic allele. So, so the, 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 the deletion approach created an early frame shift stop mutation. And this is a severe mouse model. It's neonatal lethal. It, it, it completely lacks PCCA activity, PCCA protein expression, and it has pr a pronounced elevation in methyl citrate. Whereas the hypomorphic model we created by knocking in a, a mild mutation uh, has reduced PCCA activity and reduced protein expression. But these mice are viable and live, live to, to, to adults, and they only have mild elevations in methyl citrate. So here I'm showing some of the work with, with the severe neonatal lethal model, where we identified um, in, in tissue culture, we identified a, a codon optimized allele that expressed PCCA at higher levels than both the wild type and, and other codon optimized alleles. And we package this into an AV9 using our chicken beta actin promoter. And we showed that it was able to rescue the mice, significantly reduce uh, disease related, the disease related metabolite 2 methyl citrate. And we, we saw a significant expression of the PCA protein in the livers of these mice after treatment at day 30. So, so the research I'm about to show next is done in, was done in collaboration with the ANCAS group, and it's part of the PAVE-GT project. Uh, PJ Brooks will be presenting more details about the PAVE-GT program later in the meeting. Um, so as part of this project, we're testing two candidate vectors. One that used an EF1 long uh, promoter packaged in an AV9, and another that used an EF, uh, EF1 short promoter that utilized an HPRE element to increase the expression of the PCA transgene. While initially we thought both of these effect vectors would perform similarly, similarly based on works that we've done on other diseases, uh, we, we wanted to have two candidate vectors to start with. So it's, it, to test these vectors, we treated the neonatal lethal mice with both a 1E11 and a 4E11 uh, doses of AV at birth retroverbally, and for efficacy, we looked at survival, growth, uh, biomarker changes, PCA protein and RNA expression, and PCC enzymatic activity in the tissues. Uh, what we noticed is that our, H, our HPRE, um, EF1 short HPRE cassette, performed superiorly um, in comparison to our EF1 long uh, configuration. Similarly, at the weight, at the growth level, we saw that the, the EF1 short HPRE configuration outperformed the EF1 long configuration. Uh, and uh, at the level of the biomarkers, we saw that the HPRE performed better. Both, both cassettes uh, significantly reduced um, the levels of methyl citrate. Um, unfortunately, because, of, because the EF1 long didn't work as well, we were we only, we only have two values here for the methyl citrate. But the, uh, uh, the, EF1, the EF1 short HPRE cassette performed better in these experiments. Um, at the level of PCA hepatic protein expression, the EF1 short HPRE configuration expressed more protein in the, in the livers of the treated mice versus the other vector and these levels were almost uh, to the level of the, the uh, PCA expression found in wild type mice. Um, here we're looking at RNA uh, expression 
um, using in situ RNA uh, hybridization that's specific to our, our codon-optimized opt codon PCCA allele. And we see um, the expression is brown in these hepatocyte cells. We also, we also looked at the PCCA RNA expression in the uh, cardiac or, or, hearts or heart tissues. And we saw that our, our AV9 was achieving significant amounts of expression in the hearts of, of, our, of our mice, which we feel is important because of the cardiac phenotype that some of these patients uh, do display. Uh, next, we used our hypomorphic model of PCA to test these two same vectors. Uh, we treated the mice as young adults with a clinically relevant dose, which was 5 e 12 VGs per kg. And for efficacy, we looked at the biomarker response, uh, PCA protein and PCCA RNA expression, and PCCA enzymatic activity. Uh, we saw um, a significant reduction in, in our biomarker methyl citrate only in the EF1 short HPRE group. Once again, we saw high levels of expression using our EF1 short HPRE vector in comparison to our EF1 vector. And, and I just want to point out here, these are untreated uh, hypomorphic mice. You can see some PCCA expression. That's, in, that's the endogenous PCA expression in these mice. This is looking at, at cardiac tissue, and we see superior protein expression in the cardiac tissue uh, of the mice treated with the EF1 short HPRE vector. And these are at levels that, that are similar to what the PCA expression that's found in, in wild type mice. In the hypermorphic mice, we were able to look at PCCA RNA expression. Once again, these RNA probes are very specific to our codon optimized allele, allowing us to, to, detect, uh, to detect the RNA, even though there is um, some R uh, endogenous. PCCA mouse um, expression in these tissues. And here we see uh, high levels of RNA expression in, in the hepatocytes following gene therapy. This is looking at the cardiac tissue. Uh, once again, we see, we see expression after gene therapy delivery. And this is um, uh, looking at the PCC enzymatic activity in both the cardiac and liver tissues. And we see our, our best enzymatic activity after treatment with our EF1 short HPRE uh, vector. Um, and it's at levels that are similar to um, what's found in the wild type tissues. So, so far I presented a lot of, uh, of uh, gene therapy work on uh, models of PCCA deficiency. But our lab has also created a model of PCCB deficiency using uh, Cas CRISPR uh, gene editing approach. Once again, we targeted exon uh, four uh, with an RNA guide that cuts um, in in the fourth exon and the end of the fourth exon, and relied on uh, non-homologous end joining to create uh, deletions in this allele. We generated four different uh, disease-causing alleles. All these mice are, all these alleles, um, when found in the, in the homozygous state, are lethal. Um, this is showing the, the, the mutations that we identified and the predictive protein changes. And this is showing that the PCCB protein is, is, is missing in some of these animals, but present in other animals. And, and specifically, where we, in the animals where we have uh, a, a frame shift and a stop, we, we see no protein expression. Um, these animals display elevations in methyl citrate. So we, we next wanted to test uh, one of our PCCB uh, AV vectors that we identified um, in 293 cells. Um, we identified this vector specifically um, as a codon optimized vector as expressing higher levels of PCCB and some of the other cassettes that we tested, we packaged this into an AV9. We uh, delivered this to these neonatal lethal mice. We were able to show uh, rescue of the neonatal lethal mice and a slight reduction in 
the biomarker of methyl citrate. Uh, in conclusion, the murine models of PA caused by PCCA CA and, or, or PCCB deficiency have demonstrated the potential for AV needed in gene therapy. AV um, vectors capable of correcting, uh, an AV vector capable of correcting multiple tissue types may be beneficial for treating this multisystemic uh, diseases such as PA. While the results in the murine models of PA are impressive, the translation of gene therapy approaches to humans still remains challenging. Uh, humans are prone to, to, ha to have um, immune responses against AVs that we, we don't normally see in mice. Um, the, transduction the, the transduction deficiencies in these different AVs serotypes between mice and humans can vary greatly. And, and we're able to tightly control the gene therapy experiments in mice in that uh, the mice are all on the same diet. The mice all have uh, the same gen genetic uh, defect. And this is just simply not, not possible in a, in a human clinical trial. Uh, thank you. And I'd like to thank um, my lab and all our collaborators for all the help of this work. And I can take any questions at this time. Hi, Randy. Um, good afternoon. Hi. Thanks for um, sharing with everyone the uh, animal studies and testing of the gene therapies. Uh, there was one question uh, to start us off. Um, it said, would the AAV9 also be taken up in human cardiac myocytes, or is this marine specific? Uh, the AV9, I, I think there were some studies in primates that showed that that, that will be taken up in, in primates. I, I don't know if there's any evidence in humans that that, that, that would be the case. But I mean, non-human primates, there, there has been uh, studies that show that AV9 can transduce uh, the cardiomyocytes. Um, there's another study, uh, another question here. Sorry, it says... Why do you think the methyl citrate goes down less with PCCB knockout than with the PCCA knockout? Um, I, I think it's just, I think it's variability. The, 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 I think the, the PCCA, at some of the doses, we had uh, a lot more mice. Um, the, the samples are sometimes, uh, can, can get, I, I think, contaminated. So there is some variability between mice to mice. And I think, I think if we did more PCCB mice, uh, we, we'd see uh, similar levels. But I, I, think, I think it's more to, uh, to, to variability and not a high enough N in the PCCB experiments. I think there was one outlier, actually, in the PCCB experiment. Um, there's another question here. Um, any signs of immune reaction in response to gene therapy. Um, I don't know if they're asking in the mice or, um, but that was, it just says any immune responses. Well, um, we haven't really looked into that, um, carefully. Um, so it's possible, but we, we haven't seen like any ill effects from the AVs. So, so the mice actually, you know, after treatment, they do a lot better, um, but we haven't really looked into, you know, antibodies against the capsids, T cell responses or anything like that. Um, there, there, I think that, you know, it's, it's harder to see some of those things in mice, um, but they, they definitely can, can occur in humans, but we haven't like seen, we don't think we're seeing a response to the transgene because we get, um, you know, stable expression of the transgene for a while, but, you know, we, we haven't done the careful experiments that you would need to do to show that. I had a general question. Again, these mice are very severe. They can be difficult to, um, you know, do a study, especially when you're doing an interventional study, um, trying to see the effects like this gene therapy. Um, has anyone in the field um, done any, are there any larger animal uh, disease models for the organic um, acidemias um, or are there any naturally occurring? Just question. <laughs> Um, we, we've, I, I think there's, there's some really large animals. I think, I think there might be a, I think there's been reports that moose, some type of moose or something might have organic acidemia. There, I've, I've seen some stuff in the literature about, um, dogs, but 
we've tried to kind reach out to people and we, we've never had any luck. So, uh, so far we haven't identified, I'm sure it happens. Um, you know, I'm sure these genetic defects do occur from time to time in animals and, and they probably just, I'm, I'm assuming if they're dogs, they probably just, you know, perish real quickly and, and nobody really follows up on it. So one more question directly at the science. Um, you said that you you tried the two, the EF1 long and the EF1 short, and you had expected the EF1 long um, to work better, and it didn't. So in your experience in designing these gene therapy vectors, um, is there a process, or is it that you try them, just try different ones? I mean, do you understand why possibly that one didn't work, or um, yeah. it's just after you test, you see what the effects are? No, I don't, I don't think, yeah, I don't think we, we went in with two Canada vectors. I don't, I, I mean, I, I don't think I, th I, I might've misspoke if I said we thought the one would work better, but we thought the one would end up being our lead candidate um, just because it's, it doesn't have the HPRE element in it. So, so that, I don't know, that, I don't know that that element's been in clinical trials. So we were thinking if they were both similar that we would go with just the F1 long, cause that's, that's, that there's a history behind that promoter with safety. Um, and it doesn't have the extra element, but you know, what we found out is that, 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 that one didn't perform as well. I, th I think, you know, uh, but we're not sure why, um, and, and it would probably take quite a bit of time to figure it out. So, you know, you know, we're just moving on with the one that works well. Um, but yeah, it, we've used that, that long promoter in other models and it seemed to work really well, like in, in for MMA actually. So that, that's, that's why we thought that, you know, both of those would perform equally well and look similar, but, but it, that's, I think that's the reason we decided to go in with, with two vectors instead of one in case, in case there was a, a problem with one. Okay. Um, I think that's all the questions I see in the chat currently. If any other ones come, I think you can answer them. Did, was there anything else, Randy, that you wanted to, to let everyone know that you're on live or otherwise we can go to the next talk? No, no, I'm, I'm on vacation, so I, I couldn't get my uh, some of my some of my equipment to work. But it, it so that but that's all I wanted to say in case somebody's wondering why why I don't have the background and everything. But 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 thanks uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to present. Sounds great. Thanks. We'll see you at the panel hopefully later. All right. Okay. Bye. Our last talk is um, Dr. PJ Brooks, and he's the director. He's a program director at the um, Office of Rare Disease Research, and um, I think he's going to close out um, the day talking about more of this um, platform approach for gene therapies, and then how that actually applies to scaling therapies for these under, you know, represented or small populations. How can we get therapies to um, more, more diseases, um, uh, you know, cause with the small, uh, populations of patients. So I will hand it over to PJ. Great. Hi everybody. My name is PJ Brooks. I'm a program director in the office of air diseases research at NCATS. And I'll be telling you about the PGT program for organic acidemias and also a little bit more broadly about how we think about these, these issues and the general topic of getting beyond one disease at a time to getting to all the diseases that might need to benefit from gene therapy. So my disclosure statement, no conflicts of interest, and these are my own views. So in terms of the challenge that we face in the rare disease field, it's one that's probably familiar to all of you. The number of disorders with a known molecular basis is rising rapidly, almost 6,900 now as of 2020. Um, the orange bars show the annual number of new diseases, but you can see the trend is clearly increasing. Um, the problem is that the number of disease with the approved theremies is lagging far behind. We've got about 600 now. And at the rate we're going, it's going to take many, many years until we have treatments for all disorders with a known molecular basis. And that is really the problem because we do know the molecular basis of many of these diseases. And why don't we then have more treatments? Another issue that goes into this is the actual prevalence of rare diseases, even though rare diseases have a definition of less than 200,000 in the United States. Within there, there's quite a lot of variation. There's a fairly small number of rare diseases of high prevalence. 
uh, on the order of one in 10,000. And these attract a lot of commercial interest for obvious reasons. On the far end of the spectrum, there's about 3,000 diseases with a very, very low uh, prevalence, around one in a million. And these attract almost no commercial interest, even though scientifically we might be able to address them as well as, if not better than, some of the diseases of more commercial interest. So what do we do about that problem? I think we need new strategies, new ways of thinking about this, focus on the shared molecular etiologies and essentially make fewer diseases and also optimize and utilize where possible platform approaches, including gene therapy, which I'll talk about today and try to study many diseases at a time. So this is kind of another way to look at it. You've got many diseases and we often think about the need of these to make, you know, N of one or N of a few therapies for diseases of no commercial interest. But another way to look at it is to just kind of think of them as a collective, which is say, think of them as a disease that we might call monogenic disease. And that some of the diseases that we currently think of are really different clinical manifestations of monogenic disease. And if you think of monogenic disease as a group, there's actually a limited number of therapeutic approaches, including gene therapy, gene editing and editing and oligonucleotide therapies. And we'll focus on gene therapy today. And the good news here is that adeno-associated virus or AAV vectors are able to deliver therapeutic genes to some target cells and tissues, including the liver, of particular relevance to this group here. Um, AAV virus vectors have a fairly, I would say, excellent, um, though not spotless, safety record in humans to date. There are a number of clinical success stories, including um, and two approved products, one for the eye and one for the muscle, and really a lot of different preclinical success stories, you know, uh, really beneficial effects in mouse models, some of which you've, you've seen today from Chuck and Randy. And the question is, how do you get these into clinical trials? The problem, is, as I've suggested, is doing this one disease at a time which is slow and inefficient and wasteful and biases towards the most common rare diseases. So our hypothesis in the PAVE GT program is that if we designed a clinical trial for multiple diseases at a time using the same platform AV vector, we can increase the efficiency and reduce the time of clinical trial startup. And it really takes advantage of the fact that AAV vectors are, in essence, platforms for therapeutics at a, in, a, in a very simplistic way. The way you make an AAV vector for gene therapy is you remove some of the viral genes from the AAV capsid, um, the outside of the virus, so to speak, and put in different therapeutic genes, and you make different treatments for different diseases. And in fact, the way we like to think of AV vectors is as though they're like delivery boxes, almost FedEx boxes, right, that are pre, uh, pre-addressed to go to certain tissues and cell types, the muscle, the brain, the liver, the heart, et cetera. And you could theoretically use the same delivery box to treat multiple diseases that affect, you know, these different uh, organ systems. So the idea of PAVE GT is, is to really put this approach, this platform approach to the test in a very public way. And so we developed the PAVE GT program at, at NCATS along with our colleagues at NANDS and NHGRI and Chuck Venditti and, and, and his team, as you've heard here. So we think of this as a, as a public AAV gene therapy clinical trials program. We would be going forward with clinical trials of gene therapy for, for four rare diseases under study by NIH intramural investigators. Two will be the organic acidemias, um, where the goal is primarily to target the liver, and two are neuromuscular junction disorders, where the goal is to target the muscle. And we initially plan to focus on diseases of no commercial interest, although that, of course, can vary as, as the, you know, the business climate changes. But the platform approach is to use for all four diseases the same viral vector, AV9, the same delivery box as you see on the right side, which is pre-addressed to both liver and the muscle, and to put four different therapeutic genes in there and to develop four gene therapies. Um, use the same route of administration, intravenous, the same production and purification methods for all four vectors, only swapping out the therapeutic gene constructs. Um, that's the only difference between the four different therapies. And I think the other thing that we're going to do with this, which is, as far as I'm aware, unique and different from other approaches, is that we plan to make as much as possible and as quickly as possible 
all of the methods, protocols, regulatory documents that we generate, including our communications with the FDA, uh, we plan to make those available to the public via our website as shown here. Those regular documents would also include the INDs once we get those approved so that, and our hope thereby is that other groups would be able to use those INDs and essentially cut and paste their diseases and their therapeutic genes and their data in and take those to the FDA um, to facilitate the evaluation process. We also hope to be asking some questions of the FDA about the capacity of, of this platform approach and how it can streamline the regulatory pathway. And we plan to make those answers available to the public as well. So to delve a little bit more into this, this kind of outlines the four different diseases that we plan to study within the PAVE-GT program. On the left are the two organic acidemias, PCCA deficiency, apropionic acidemia, um, and MMAB deficiency, a form of methylmalonic acidemia, particularly rare form of methylmalonic acidemia. And on the right, you've got the two neuromuscular diseases, DOC7 deficiency and ColQ deficiency. So the typical way you would do this, if, if you're going to do one disease at a time, as indicated by the dotted lines, is for each disease, you would have to do a proof of concept, evaluate the, the vector CMC, the process by which the vector is, the chemistry is sort of analyzed to see if it's up to spec, um, evaluate the biodistribution of the vectors, the toxicology of the, of the vector and constructs, and then ultimately carry out the clinical trial and do each one of these things one at a time over and over again, even though you're using the same AV9 vector, which seems you know, really duplicative and, and a slow way to do it. So the idea with PAVE-GT is because we are gonna be using the same platform, the same vector, the same manufacturing process, et cetera, the question we're gonna be asking is, can we um, reduce or skip some of these steps that one would normally go through in developing clinical trials. So for example, about biodistribution, the biodistribution of the AV vector with the gene in it, we would anticipate should be the same um, for AV vectors depending, regardless of what the DNA sequence is in there, because the biodistribution should be determined by the outside of the vector. And if that's the case, then it may not be necessary to carry out the biodistribution the same way four times in a row. Uh, there may be other steps that we can reduce some of the, the time involved and the extensive, the, the extent of analysis in the area of toxicology and CMC, et cetera. We don't know the answer to these things. We plan to ask the questions and find out what the FDA thinks and make that information available. And one other benefit that we have here within PAVE GT is something we actually didn't intend originally, but it so happens that we have two organic acidemias and two neuromuscular junction diseases. And within each of those groups, there are similarities in terms of the clinical outcome measures. So we almost have a, a platform within a platform here of really two clinical trial uh, protocols, and that may further increase the efficiency of the overall PAVE GT effort. So that's kind of a description of what we hope to do in PAVE-GT. And just want to particularly mention that this is a, a group effort involving a total of 34 people at the NIH, including uh, my colleague, Ann Pariser at the Office of Rare Diseases Research, Liz Ottinger and Don Lowe at NCATS, and uh, Carson Bonham, Bonneman, and of course, Chuck Venditti and his team who were the organic acidemia parts of this, this meeting. We obviously couldn't do this without these two uh, these very talented clinical investigator teams. And there's the website. We've got a publication as well that you can take a look at. Um, and we'll be happy to answer more, more questions about this at the end. And then wanted to talk about for some time about another uh, effort that I'm involved with. This is one that is still kind of under construction. And it's a bit of a similar idea. It's something we call the Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium or the BGTC which is a developing public-private partnership dedicated to making gene therapy a reality for people with rare genetic diseases affecting populations too small to be viable from the current commercial perspective. So, so the broad goal is, or the broad issue of the BGTC is very similar to PAVGT, but some significant differences are that this is a public-private partnership, so will involve collaborations with uh, private industry, 
um, and it's being sponsored and organized by the foundation for the NIH, which is actually not part of the NIH. It's an entirely separate 501 C3 entity. And we're also partnering here with the FDA center for biologics in, in kind of designing the, the general BGTC program, which you think will facilitate, uh, you know, some of the regulatory streamline that we hope to achieve. So there's basically two kind of components to the BGTC as indicated here. The top is focused on the basic biology of AEV, the basic biology of, of how you make AEV vectors, recombinant AEV vectors for gene therapy uh, in, in you know, production facilities. And also if we can ultimately enhance the way that they function once they get into people. Um, so that's the basic biology component. And then the second component is, is advancing access to technologies of vectors for clinical applications. And there'll be components focused on vector manufacturing and also um, trying to streamline the clinical development. So for the AAV biology, the way we plan to go about this is to break down the various steps involved in, in creating AV vectors in production facilities. Um, there's, there's various mechanistic steps that, that happen when you're making AV vectors. Um, and each of those steps we think can be optimized separately to increase the efficiency of the process. And that's what we propose to do. These are the five steps as indicated here. Similarly, there are roughly five or six steps between the infection of a, of a cell with a therapeutic AV vector and ultimately expression of the therapeutic gene. And there again, what we plan to do is to develop or, or ask the community to develop high throughput compatible assays for each one of these mechanistic steps. And then to carry out high throughput screening, either whole genome screening or um, uh, drug screening to see if we can optimize each one of these steps and ultimately improve the processes of both vector generation and therapeutic gene expression um, as much as possible. Then the cl clinical component is indicated here um, to really speed the time and or reduce the time between the idea of a gene therapy for a disease and ultimately getting the therapy into patients in the clinical trial. We're anticipating a pilot project of what we plan is five or six diseases using a limited number of AAV serotypes that are already in clinical use, um, indeed ones that have already been, in, you know, had INDs approved and even approved products such as AV9, a standardized package of vector analytics and toxicology, um, and a harmonized clinical trial design, which would allow for um, the reporting of, of adverse events as well as clinical benefits. Um, and I think one of the important things is by having the standardized analytics for each of the different vectors that will help us to better interpret some of these adverse events in a way that's not been possible before. And we see this as part of a, a learning effort in which all of the results from these treatments will go back to the consortium for iterative learning. And indeed, we'll also um, feed back with the activities of the, the basic biology components as well. And of course, a big question is going to be, how are we going to select diseases for these uh, pilots? We anticipate, as I said, five or six diseases. And what we're thinking so far, and I, I should mention that, as I said, the BGTC is still kind of under development, so it's not, we haven't figured out everything completely yet. But the basic idea we're thinking about is that we will have some kind of a, a process by which people can propose different diseases for possible inclusion in the BGTC. Um, and basically we'll be looking at our diseases that are well suited for gene therapy because the goal of this really is to, to change the, the whole process, the whole regulatory process. We don't wanna be focused on diseases that are where there's gonna be a lot of hurdles involved in even getting them to an AAV clinical trial. And again, one of the key things will be focusing on diseases that are of no commercial interest. And this project has involved a lot of collaboration and partnership with many different entities, including many of, you know, from pharmaceutical companies as listed here, many different parts of the NIH, um, and also some patient advocacy groups. Uh, we developed the concept and kind of thought through and, and come up with a project plan. And right now we're in the process of finalizing the financial commitments coming from 
the NIH, the pharmaceutical companies, and other other um, stakeholders, and we anticipate getting this project up and running later in the summer of 2021. Uh, like everything else, this project was the development of this was impacted by COVID as well. And this is kind of another way of showing the the timing of this um, as we've gone through and is indicated here, looking at. Uh, launching in the summer of 2021. And just to kind of compare these two efforts, because they do sound some, somewhat similar, PAVE-GT and the BGTC. On the one case, we got four diseases selected for PAVE-GT, and um, we'll be looking to choose five or six more for the BGTC. We, we would not want the same disease to be chosen or the same, uh, I think that would be duplicative. Um, in PAVE-GT, we'll have a single manufacturer, whereas in BGTC, we'll have a consortium. Uh, PAVE-GT is public, all done by the NIH, and that was intentional because you want to make available into the public domain all of this regulatory material that would otherwise be considered as um, intellectual property. The BGTC is public and private. We'll do all the, the clinical work for PAVE-GT at the NIH Clinical Center, and BGT could be in multiple clinical sites, which may include the NIH Clinical Center. Um, and PAVE-GT will be one serotype, AV9, as we're anticipating it now, whereas the BGTC, we expect multiple serotypes to really test out the, the flexibility of, of this platform approach. And I guess just to end there, just kind of a nice idea comment about an approach to how we deal with these diseases of limited commercial interest. We often think about, you know, uh, trials for very rare diseases, and you, you hear about the term um, personalized medicine sometimes. But I think the real opportunity is to sort of industrialize some of these personalized approaches. And I think some of the efforts that we're talking about with the BGTC and, and, and PAVE-GT, as well as some other work that we're doing with oligonucleotides and gene editing are all going towards that goal um, to get beyond the situation where we're having to do things one disease at a time. And I'll just stop there and thank my colleagues in Office of Rare Diseases Research at NCATS uh, we have a variety of programs I didn't have a time to talk about. Um, I'm from NCATS. There's my email. I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, thank you for your attention. Hi, PJ. Good afternoon. Thank you for, um, again, um, sharing the PAVE-GT platform, which I think we're all very excited about um, and hoping that it actually does help the community to um, by especially for the PAVE GT where we plan to share everything. Um, there was a couple of questions. Um, one was asking if you could maybe explain, they hear a lot of terms, you know, platform trials, umbrella trials, um, adaptive. Um, could you say what the, the, you know, what some of the differences are or are they the same um, for people to understand? Yeah, I can try. People use use different terms in different ways, um, and the, those those terms can also be applied to sort of clinical trials of small molecules, where you use a you know one specific drug across different diseases. Um, here, we're really focused. The platform is is the AV gene therapy. Um, and specifically, what we're thinking about is AAV9, and it is a platform for all the reasons I said. It's kind of like a delivery vehicle, and that's the platform that we're going to be using for multiple diseases. Um, but there is are there different. Any, is there any clinical aspect to the for the clinical trials? Any aspect of the platform, or um, maybe in that sense, for um, or the umbrella that's known in cancer um, trials. I think the cancer trials, we, where you typically, you're usually using one specific drug, so it's the same drug, and treating multiple different kinds of cancers. Um, and that actually is a regulatory pathway that's led to drug approvals. And we have another program going on in ORDR to try to support trials like that, basket trials in rare diseases. 
but but Pave GT is different and AAV is different because the, while the delivery box is the same, the gene you put into it is different. So for each of the diseases, you really do have have a different type of therapeutic. And so we can't exactly have one clinical, like like in in Pave GT, we, we're not having one clinical trial that includes all the diseases, which is what we're hoping to do with a small molecule approach in in um, in the other program I mentioned. Okay, um, and I think there's a question too, trying to understand, probably more related to the bespoke, bespoke consortium is how you would deal with the FDA part of this. Um, I think because you mentioned that you would, um, like how would you lump them together, um, which I guess could be even for PAVE GT2, um, mm -hmm. that you could comment, um, you know, how much are they really lumped together in terms of their regulatory path? I think the lumping together is really the regulatory path on, on getting the clinical trial started. And that's where we hope to accelerate the process. And that diagram I showed was kind of an indication of that, that if you use the same, the same vector and the same, um, let's see, particularly analytics for looking at the vector, you can just streamline the process. But ultimately you would have, by the time they got to a potentially FDA approval, if any of them do, and we're talking about very, very rare diseases where some of them may not, but if they do, they would still be approved as, as treatments for individual diseases. So, so they kind of streamline the process getting up to the uh, ultimate drug approval is what we're thinking. So you still though would have individual INDs, correct? For, for each gene product. I would think so, yes, but I think that there's the idea of a master protocol where there can be linkages and some of the same materials where it's the same, you can basically you know, cut and paste that um, or maybe even cross-reference to it. And that's, that's where I think some of the streamlining can come in. Okay. Um, and I know that you know, you've had many other um, conferences also that manufacturing is one of the the big, you know, like you have for the bespoke, bespoke consortium. So, um, you know, I think someone was asking about um, actually looking at other delivery platforms. And I guess where you think that fits into the field right now, is it focusing on trying to optimize the manufacturing, um, you know, using the AAV9 and using the AAVs, or is it that we need new technologies that you have different delivery methods that might make the manufacturing you know, more cost effective or easier um, to carry out for more of a personalized, probably approach? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, again, my own personal opinion is I think that sort of the where this is really going is towards using delivering messenger RNAs, as, as sort of Chuck referred to. Um, but I think the real, ex the thing I'm most excited about in the future is that we would be able to deliver messenger RNAs and coding genome editors. So you may get to the point where you had one genome editor that could be used for multiple diseases. And then the way that the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editors work, the way they're targeted within the genome is they use a guide RNA, which is an oligonucleotide. So you might imagine genome editor delivered as a messenger RNA. And by the way, this is the same technology that many of the vaccines we've taken have, have been made from. Uh, and, you know, that, that would be your sort of delivery system. And to go from one disease to the next or one person to the next, you'd just be looking at changing the sequence of the guide RNA. And I think that is, would be getting towards the most, uh, the ultimate platform approach to treating genetic diseases. Another program I'm involved with the NIH called the Somatic Cell Genome Editing Program. We have multiple efforts going on to develop better delivery vehicles for genome editors, uh, and many of those are nanoparticles directed to tissues other than the liver, because the, the liver is, is pretty easy to deliver to. I mean, the, 
the, the good thing about the liver is when you inject something into the blood, pretty much everything goes to the liver, which is good for liver diseases, not so good for diseases that affect other tissues. So I think those kind of delivery approaches, delivering messenger RNAs uh, is ultimately the, the future. But if you want to do something right now, um, AAV gene therapy for monogenic diseases works. And that's why we're doing it in PAVE GT. Um, well, we're at four o'clock um, and I know that we're supposed to move into the panel. So I think we'll end there and hopefully you can answer any of the other questions um, online, PJ. And so thank you everyone for attending the four afternoon talks. And we'll now turn it over to Oleg, who is going to lead the final panel. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>